Good morning. Welcome to worship on this last Sunday of April, uh, April 24th. Uh, 2022. A special welcome to all of you who are worshiping here in person and uh, worshiping from home. Uh, just a few reminders before we begin our worship this morning. Uh, a special happy birthday to all our April birthdays. I hope you received my card. Uh, I hope all of you uh, had a great birthday. Uh, worship bulletin was emailed to you and is available on our website at cccei.org. Uh, if you're worshiping from home, uh, I ask that you turn off all your devices over at home and, you know, let go of any distractions and really focus in and, and, and uh, really be united uh, together with the power of the Holy Spirit. If you have any prayer requests, uh, please uh, leave a comment in the chat bar or, uh, or uh, let uh, one of our council members know. Our God calls us to uh, worship this morning uh, with these words from Zephaniah chapter 3. I invite you to follow along in the bolded words. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let's pray. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Jesus, we thank you for bringing us into worship this morning to continue to celebrate and give honor to our resurrection hope. This morning, may those who feel pain, loss, or deep sadness experience a hope and peace that surpasses understanding. For those that feel overwhelmed or anxious, may they feel a sense of peace and calm that one can't even fathom. May this worship draw us nearer to the power of the gospel once again. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. 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 I invite you to rise in body and spirit. Let's greet one another and share God's peace. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day when He rose again, when He rose again. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is This is the day, this is the day when the Spirit came, when the Spirit came. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day when the Spirit came, we will rejoice and be glad. Let's sing that one more time. This is the day when the Spirit came. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day when the Spirit came. Amen. You may be seated. Our God and Savior calls us into a time of corporate confession this morning with these words. 
how does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make a share in the righteousness he obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already raised to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our, ple- uh, of our blessed resurrection. I invite us to think back upon this past week. If there is any a moment where you've wanted to be comfortable, if there's a moment where you've chosen yourself before Jesus, if there's a moment where you have chosen what you wanted to do instead of what Jesus wanted you to do, I invite you to bring it down to the foot of the cross in this time of corporate confession. Let's go to God. Hear these words of assurance. I will take you from the nations and gather you from the countries and bring you into your own land. I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We've confessed our sins. We've been assured of our pardon. I invite us now to rise in body and word spirit so that we can, as one church, declare our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Let's all rise and we say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and a life everlasting. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them Flowing, sing this praise. Let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands. Take my hands and let them move.
We've come to a time in our service where we have a brief time of announcements. I invite you to t uh, turn your attention to the bulletins. Uh, this week, our ladies Bible study uh, will be meeting on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Thursday night prayer will be held via Zoom at thir on Thursday at 7 p.m. Men's Bible study will be on Saturday at 7 a.m. All our gatherings are all always accessible uh, via Zoom. Uh, this Saturday, we are meeting at church uh, for our spring work day. Um, I, I think uh, we'll have some goodies, breakfast, coffee available. Um, so please uh, uh, make sure you come out. Um, I do know that some of us, we like eating before we work, so that's okay, too. And some of us like working, build up that appetite, and then you eat. So that works, too. So either way, I hope we can have a big turnout like we've had the past couple work days. Um, I'm a big baseball fan, so this is a big announcement. Our church family, we're going to be going to uh, – uh, catch the Mets play the Marlins on June 18th. Uh, if you recall, a few years ago, pre-pandemic, we went as a church family together, and it was fun just being with uh, one another as a family in Christ. But it was cold. I, I was some of us uh, went to the merchandise store and bought eighty-dollar sweaters um, to try to, to to try to stay warm. So. Uh, Let's pray that June 18th is not as cold as it was. Um, but another goal is to, to uh, attend the faith day festivities. Um, uh, Kay loved the radio, Christian radio station as well as Lead NYC, a big Christian organization in the city. They host uh, the faith day where uh, they're just trying to get as many, uh, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ all together. Uh, and so uh, before the game, they're going to have a big worship team out in the uh, where the, the old apple is, the, the in front of the Jackie Robinson Rotunda. 
if you've been to a Mets game lately, that's where um, they're going to have a big worship team out there. And then after the game, they're going to have uh, some, uh, some Mets players uh, share their testimonies on why they love Christ. Um, they're going to have a time of worship. Uh, last time, Daryl Strawberry came and preached. So um, if you know the name Daryl Strawberry, him preaching, what? But that's the thing, that Jesus can do a mighty deed. Um, so that's the goal, where we can go catch a game, uh, good fellowship, and, and also uh, really be in fellowship with a lot of Christians across metropolitan New York. Um, if uh, you don't have the money, that's fine, but I actually need a head count by today. The group sales representative um, would like some sort of a head count, so you don't have to commit with money, but you can say, uh, big, big question mark, but put me down for now. And then we can adjust. So uh, I have a clipboard with all the names. I did print out a couple names for for the people who have received a text or email. But for those uh, who still have yet to, uh, should I go? Should I go? <laughs> if you're able, um, it will be fun. Membership class, I apologize. We haven't really been able to set a date. I have uh, multiple people that have expressed interest and signed up but I will tr hopefully try to get back to you uh, this week. Women's ministry retreat, um, uh, as I was praying this week, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited for what God has in store for our first ever inaugural women's ministry retreat uh, with the great speaker as well. Um, so let's keep in prayer for that. If you haven't signed up yet, please do sign up. Uh, don't sign up too late. Uh, and for those of you worshiping from home. Uh, the live feed is, is struggling this morning because of Wi-Fi issues. So that's a sign to, for, from the Lord telling you you should have been, been here instead of worshiping from home. Um, so the live stream is struggling and, and I'm freezing quite a bit. So next time, don't worship it from home. Come to church. All right. Next week, life groups. I'm. This is what I'm so excited about. Life groups is launching and what it is, is it's an opportunity where we can really be in fellowship with one another, but grow together uh, as a body of Christ. Um, so next week, if you are born in 1954, okay, and up, all right, then you're my first life group that I'm going to hang out with. So next Sunday, if you're born before 1954, plan on staying after church. We're going to have some pizza and we'll uh, have a time of uh, fellowship together, um, time of prayer together. And I'm going to, I've already drafted a, a pop quiz of, of uh, really fun, fun trivia uh, for people who were born before 1954. So I looked it up and I studied and, you know, so we'll, we'll have a lot of fun together um, as a church family. May 8th, obviously, is Mother's Day, so we won't meet. And then May 15th, for those of you, church family, who are born between 1955 and 1962. That's kind of like the biggest group we have in our church. So, you know, we had to shrink the years there. Uh, we'll be meeting May 15th. And then May 22nd, for those of you who are born uh, 1963 to 1979, um, if you want to pick and choose your life group, sorry, you know, we're not, it's, you know, we're, we're going by this because the council thought it would be really awesome to really be together with life stages. And for those of you born after 1979, the date will be to determine, uh, to be determined because we happen to have two moms, uh, in our church family that have just given birth or will give birth this week. So we will, um, uh, uh have that that date to be determined uh can we have the prayer requests it's okay she she's she's bringing it up it's okay <laughs> yeah, there are there any additional prayer requests that are not on the prayer cards Yes. Okay. And for George to adjust to being a big sibling. Okay. All right. 
please join me in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the, the opportunity we have to, to worship you. We thank you for the opportunity we have to pray uh, to you at this time. Lord, we have a lot of unspoken prayer requests. Um, we have those in our church family that are battling various health battles, mental battles, uh, emotional battles, spiritual battles. Lord, we pray that you may be with them. Uh, bless them, O oh Lord. Father, we have those who are also... Um, struggling with anxiety, battling with anxiety. I pray that you may uh, give them the right tools that they need um, to really just combat anxiety and nervousness as well. Father, we also thank you for the praise reports that we've been able to share, uh, especially at our Thursday night prayer gatherings uh, where we've been able to witness prayers being answered. And Lord, we are reminded once again that uh, prayers can be answered not on our time, but on your time alone. So, Father, we uh, we stand with uh, the Frank family this morning as they lift up their their brother, uh, Joe, uh, who is having bypass and valve replacement surgery on Thursday. Lord, uh, any major surgery is is nerve wracking uh, as as loved ones uh, gather in prayer. Father, I pray that you may uh, utilize uh, Amy and and Rob for such a time as this to really just be a light to their siblings and their family, uh, so that they can really just uh, just shine. Uh, how powerful prayer is for such a time as this, Lord. I pray that you may be with Joe, be with those who are surround, uh, who will be working on him, Lord. I pray that you may also just uh, really just let Joe experience and encounter Christ through uh, this surgery, um, this major surgery, so that he can truly be able to say, wow, God is real. So, Father, I pray that you may uh, utilize the Frank family uh, for such a time as this. Father, we also stand with the Stewart family. Lord, we praise you for the gift of new life. Uh, Lord, I pray for a uh, healthy, smooth, safe delivery this week, Lord. Uh, we pray that you, uh, you may be with Gina. I pray that you may bless her abundantly. I pray that you may be with George as he adjusts to life as an older sibling. Be with Zach as well as he uh, does what he can to be a good husband and a good dad. Uh, and, Lord, I pray that you may also be with Gina as C-section recoveries uh, are, are, are not easy. So, Lord, I pray for, uh, for that as well. I pray for uh, my family. pray for the Lee family. I pray that you may continue to be with Jen as she uh, recovers from her C-section, Lord, uh, and as she uh, continues to parent uh, three kids, Lord. Uh, Father, I also pray, Lord, for our spring work day pray that you may be uh, with the church family that will be here to, to fellowship and to serve uh, and, and spruce up uh, the church campus. Father, we pray that you may uh, really just um, do a mighty deed uh, through our time together uh, this week. And Lord, as we get ready to launch life groups, Father, we pray that you alone can be glorified. And may this uh, be an opportunity for us to grow in your word, grow in prayer, uh, and may this be an opportunity for us to really experience what the body of Christ is, where we rejoice with those who rejoice and hurt with those who hurt. We thank you once again for the power of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to the person next to you and ask them, are you ready for the gospel? God is good, and all the time. It's an honor and privilege to come before God's word together. If you've uh, kept an eye out on social media as well as our newsletters, I'm starting a new series this morning, the book of Philippians. Um, they call it, the, the experts call it expository preaching. I like calling it Bible study style preaching. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that's the, uh, that's what we'll be going through in the past, in the next several weeks. So my hope and prayer is that this is going to be um, just fruitful, encouraging, uplifting. Um, there's a lot of encouragement in, in, in the letter to the Church of Philippi. So I pray that um, for those of us who were weary or have been battle tested over the past couple years, I pray that this letter really just encourages us in ways that we can't even fathom. So let's turn to God's word. 
God's word this morning comes to us from the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to invite us to read starting from verse 3 through verse 11. The scripture reading is available in your bulletins as well as the screen in front of you. Uh, so if you're there, I invite us to rise in body or in spirit so that we can give reverence and honor God's holy and sacred word. Like I said, let's start reading this together uh, from verse 3. Ready, begin. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer as we ask the Lord to illuminate our hearts. God of life, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and writers of scripture. Your spirit draws us to Christ and helps us to acknowledge him as Lord. We ask that you will send your spirit now to give us deeper insight, encouragement, faith, and hope through the proclamation of Jesus Christ. For this we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. Paul was, uh, was in prison as he was writing this letter to the church in Philippi. Now, Philippi was a Roman uh, military colony on the eastern side of Macedonia, uh, so the location is quite strategic in the ministry that Paul was doing. Now, because it was an urban political center uh, in such a strategic location with quite a bit of socioeconomic diversity and a lot of uh, boat traffic, a lot of foot traffic where people passed through, Paul had a special concern for the church here in the Philippi. Now, at this time, Paul was in prison with Silas for exorcising a demon from a fortune-telling slave girl. Now, if you're in prison, you normally would be upset. You wouldn't be happy. You would be doing whatever you can to try to get out of prison. But even amid that situation, Paul is writing to encourage the Philippians to live out their lives as kingdom citizens. Throughout this entire letter, we see themes of encouragement all over the place. We see a Paul who's so personable and warm and who pours out his heart of affection for those in Philippi. Now, the core group of the church in Philippi were formed by a group of God-fearing women who had been meeting by the water for prayer because of the lack of a synagogue in the city. Praise God. Paul was moved by that. These God-fearing women were doing whatever they can to, to gather, even though the church wasn't there. They were gathering there by the water to pray, doing whatever they can, even amid strife or turmoil, to worship and pray together. Now, that sounds a lot like what we see with the Ukrainian church today. Whether you believe it or not, churches throughout this war that the Ukraine is going through have been meeting week in and week out and week in and week out. And if you get a chance to see some of the video of th these worship services, you can even hear the, the, the siren, the air siren, alerting about missile attacks in the background as they're singing, it is well with my soul. Now, if you get a chance to see some of those videos, obviously, for time's sake, I'm not going to turn the video on here. You can see God moving in people's hearts, even amid strife or turmoil. 
Paul testified of this high, of his heart for this church earlier on in 2 Corinthians. If you look at 2 Corinthians 8, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about that grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. You know, we're getting ready to, to uh, go on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic this summer. Um, but I've been fortunate and blessed to lead multiple missions trips uh, throughout the years. And one of the missions trips I led over in Guatemala many years ago, we went to such a rural village where it takes like two hours for you to walk to the closest health clinic. Two hours, right? And there's a lot of discrimination there, especially if you're a native there. And when I went to go attend the worship service, it wasn't even a building. It was just a little tent. But there was so much joy in worshiping the Lord. There was so much joy. So much joy to the point where I wanted to bring that back here to the church in our country. Because we're so busy doing whatever we want to do, we have lost the joy in coming together as a body of Christ. Joy. Paul's deep affection for this congregation was evidenced by their growing commitment and service and joy to God and to one another. Now, who is this letter for? Paul writes once again with an introduction that looks quite similar to most of his letters, if not all. And if you look here at the end of verse 1, he writes, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now, the word saints is from the biblical Greek word hagios, hagios, which translates to being set apart from God. Set apart. Now, this doesn't mean the folks at the church in Philippi were sinless, but this is Paul testifying and also calling out, calling them out to a higher standard. If you're an elder of the church, if you're a deacon of the church, if you're a pastor of the church, if you're a leader of the church, if you are a son of God, a daughter of Christ, you're called to a higher standard. Because of that relationship with Christ Jesus, they are set apart by God and for God. Now, if we transition to the readers in the church of Philippi, you're going to get this compliment filled. And, and you're getting this compliment filled, encouragement filled, joy filled, thank you letter. You're going to feel good. If you put yourself in the shoes of the readers and you're a member of the church of Philippi and you're getting this just sugar coated letter of just thank you for doing this, you're awesome, you're great. This letter is not going to make you upset whatsoever. Affirmation is always a good thing. But Paul, after his introduction, he, be he begins with this gratitude, this big thank you to the Lord for the sake of the church in Philippi. Now, obviously, time had passed since Paul officially worked with them. But even while he was in prison, he was still writing in thanksgiving. He was praying with joy. Church, I don't know about you, but where was the joy, just joy coming from? I mean, for crying out loud, this guy was stuck in prison. Where is this joy coming from? Where's the root cause? Where's the origin? Look at verse 5 with me. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I think we found the answer. The word partnership in the biblical Greek used here is koinonia. Koinonia can also be translated as fellowship or participation. That's what we're going to do as a church with life groups. That's what we're going to do when we see the Mets beat the Marlins on June 18th. Amen, Rob? Amen. Fellowship is not just being with one another, but it's a participation of being part of the body of Christ. You can't do that in the comforts of your couch from home. Participation of the body of Christ. Public service announcement, spring work day to Saturday, 8.15 a.m. Hallelujah. We even need cheerleaders to, to cheer us on, right, Frank? Amen. Amen. Joy lies at the heart of the participation of the gospel. 
Joy lies at the heart of the Christian experience of the gospel. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and oh, joy. Joy. This joy was not coming from human or worldly conditions. It was coming from the Lord. Paul was able to give things in joy even amid his hardships because the Philippian saints and Paul were partners and co-laborers for Christ. Participants in Christ and for Christ. In the sharing of time and fellowship they had together, that brought great joy to Paul's heart. In other words, Paul is saying, thank you, God, that these saints have been with me since day one. That faith, that joy that is translated into this great confidence. You guys tracking with me, church? Joy is now trans being transitioned into this great confidence. Verse 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pause there. Think about this. If we're in the present day situation, you get a letter from an old friend who you know who's stuck in prison for being up to no good. And they're telling you, hey, it's all going to work out. You're going to do great. You're going to be great. Your prayers are going to be answered. How in the world are you going to answer that? How are you going to respond? I don't know about you, but if I have an old friend of mine that sends me a letter saying that I'm great, I'm awesome, that God's going to hear all my prayers, I'm probably going to look at the letter and go, what in the world? <laughs> Where did this confidence come from? You're stuck in prison, buddy. Where does this strong personal conviction come from? Well, Scripture teaches us the answer. Because it was God who certainly continued to complete the good work that he had begun in time. It was God who was completing the good work. It was salvation that was being done through God, for God, by God. Paul was recognizing and acknowledging that the good work that started from the Lord will be brought to full completion and satisfaction. Paul was writing with full joy and faith that what God started, he's going to finish. God's not going to do something haphazardly and not finish it. If, God someone, if God's at work in someone's heart and you're like, but why aren't they going to church? Why aren't they loving Jesus? Why aren't they being a Christian? Guess what? Then let's jump in faith and say, if God did something in that person, he's going to bring it to fruition. Maybe not in my time, but in his time. That is the true joy that we have been gifted with through salvation. True joy, Christ-centered joy can lead us into that confidence and assurance where I can say, guess what, church? I believe God's going to use our church 10 years from now. If I said that five years ago, some of you might be like, we're struggling. If I tell you, church, I believe God's going to use all our people 15 years from now. Some of you are chuckling. <laughs> I'm not even going to be here on this earth 15 years from now. Never say never. Because God might not work through you, but God might work through your legacy. I've shared about my grandfather multiple times. He passed and went home to be with the Lord in September of 2020. Uh, but his book, uh, his biography, my aunt wrote his bio biography, and that's coming out and is going to be uh, available worldwide now. And that book, as I was reading through it, I was just bawling. But I heard through my aunt. Apparently, she gifted that book to multiple parliament members in Canada. My aunt's Canadian, you know, and my uncle's a big-time lobbyist, so they're, they're, they're friends with people who are just way too rich. But apparently, they were hosting a dinner party with a handful of parliament members, and my aunt decided to just talk about my, her dad, my, my grandfather. 
and started giving that book away to each person that was at that dinner table. This is not by coincidence, by chance. Two people ended up calling her a week later and said, can you tell me more about what this Jesus is? My grandfather is not here on this earth. I went to his grave. I saw him. He's not here on this earth. But God's still using him. God is still using him. So church, true joy, Christ-centered joy can lead us into that confidence and assurance that even if I'm not here on this earth, God's still going to use me. And if you believe that, you can say amen. God can still be at work. I'm sure there's loved ones, even in your families, that have gone home to be with the Lord that is still at work in your heart. What does that mean? God is still using them. What does that mean? That the spirit never dies. The spirit of the Lord is alive and well. So why do we have this confidence and assurance? Verse 7, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This verse teaches us that Paul and the Philippians had each other in their hearts. They were looking out for each other, but not based on conditions, not based on what they did for each other, but based on the sole fact that they were partakers, partakers of grace, partakers of grace. Do you determine who your friends are based on, what you do for them or what they do for you? I don't think so. They're probably really not good friends then if that's what you do. Do you determine what your church is based on what they do for you? Hmm, I'm going to choose a church um, if they give me a good sermon, if the pastor doesn't make me fall asleep during the sermon, and if they have, uh, if, if I don't have to serve on church leadership and I can sit back and just sneak out, hmm, I wonder what the church can do for me. No. Do you, de do you determine what, what country you want to live in based on what they do for you? Hmm, do I get free this, free that, free this, free that, and I don't have to work, and I do? Maybe I'm getting too political now. Paul and the Philippians didn't have these conditions. Paul was celebrating and giving gratitude, giving praise, and stating the fact that God unconditionally was doing a mighty deed through him and the saints of Philippi unconditionally. Paul's confidence and conviction was coming from the fact that God was using them to spread the gospel. Through this partnership, the gospel was being spread. Through ways that people can't even fathom, the gospel was being spread. And if you see some good things happening, if you see people carrying out the mission that you feel called to as well, your heart of affection is going to explode. Verse 8, for God is my witness. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. This affection wasn't just a simple, oh, I like you. I think you're awesome. I think I can do church with you because I think I like you. I think I can do church with you because you brought a great a meal for my wife uh, during that meal train that my wife had. No, that's not it. This affection comes from Christ. My affection as your pastor for you isn't based on what you do for me or what you do for my family. My affection needs to and has to, and I hope you can keep me accountable, needs to stem from Christ. My love for you folks is not based on what you do for me or what I do for you, but it's from Christ. How I can yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. That's not a simple I like you because you do this for me. That's not a simple, I like you because, uh, and so let me do this for you. That affection needs to originate in Christ. Our passage then takes a big transition from all these praises, all these gratitudes, and now a, a prayer of a petition. Now here's his first prayer. Look at verse 9 with me. It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. 
Paul's not calling them out and saying, oh, you know, you're not loving enough. You, you need love. That's not what he's talking about right now. What this means is Paul is praying that the church in Philippi can experience a love from the Lord that is beyond their imagination, that is beyond what they can ever fathom so that it can be an overflow, so that it can be infectious, so that it can spread like wildfire. Christ's love had overwhelmed Paul so much that Paul couldn't bear to not share that love. You know, we have this big saying in our country, you know, we're paying it forward. We're paying it forward. If in the Starbucks drive through line, somebody in front of you pays for your drink, you're probably going to be like, oh, man, I, gotta, I guess I got to pay for the person behind me. And you pay it forward when you receive some love that you feel like you don't deserve. But guess what? We believers don't know how to pay it forward because we can't come to terms with what this love is. We beat ourselves up. We're so busy. We're so busy with our to-do list, our, our, our tasks and what we do. We don't ever take, I mean, especially busy New Yorkers, right? Sorry. But busy New Yorkers, we're so busy that we don't pause in the middle of the day to dwell in how much Christ has loved us. And if you pause in the middle of your day to, to experience, wow, I don't deserve this love. Yet, Christ has overwhelmed me with love. Your life will never be the same. If you give yourselves a moment where your QT and your devotionals aren't even just a to-do list, a test. Okay, I got my Bible reading done. Check. I got my ear Bible reading done. Check. Finally, out of, out of Leviticus. Check. Right? Amen. Check, right? No. What Paul's trying to teach us is that we need to learn how to, to pause so that we can see and witness how overwhelming the love of Christ is. Where we can pause and go, wow, I don't deserve this love. Yet Jesus loved me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. We Christians... If we get a chance to experience that overwhelming love of Christ, just maybe, just maybe we can change this world. I think the world's not changing because we're forgetting the overwhelming love of Christ. We believers have received an eternal love from Christ in ways where we don't deserve, and that overloving, lo overflowing love should spew out to those around. You know, Paul's smart, though. His prayer and his call isn't just about a lovey-dovey kind of love. It's not, all right, be like Oprah and share that love, share that love, share that love. No. Paul's pretty smart. Look carefully. He said, but, but make sure it's filled with the knowledge of God's will and wisdom of discernment. That love isn't just any kind of love. That love it should be uh, filled with the knowledge of God's will and with the foundation of the wisdom of discernment. We're not talking about our own knowledge. We're not talking about the knowledge, you know, knowledge that we think we have. We're talking about the knowledge of the Lord. I challenge you, church. Maybe you got to go home to your spouse and you say, you know, I love you not based on my love, but I love you based on the knowledge of the Lord. I'm probably going to have to do that too. Go home and say, honey, I love you based on the knowledge of the Lord. Why? We need more of Christ and his wisdom. Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. As Christians grow in understanding of what it means to follow Christ, they're going to be able to affirm and practice what is excellent. You see, joyful obedience to God will get full confidence of the holy call and being set apart and pure and blameless when Jesus returns. This isn't just a simple magic trick of, bam, everyone is pure and blameless. We're all good, goody, goody, two-shoe Christians now. We're good. No. This is a process. This is a journey. Some like to call it sanctification as we journey to be more like Christ. Now, if you take a step back and think about, think about more of this context, Paul was writing 
not to sugarcoat and fluff people up and be a cheerleader and say, all right, guys, you got this. Paul is writing with encouragement, vigor, and love, even if it was tough love. That choice of words for pure and blameless isn't necessarily to guilt trip anyone, but more so to call the church to a higher standard, to call the people of faith to a higher standard set apart from the world. You shouldn't fit in to the things of the world. You shouldn't react in the ways of the world. You should be set apart from the world. My wife and I, when we're driving down Sunrise Highway, and there's that one car that always just cuts in front of you. Can I get a witness? There's that one car, right? Nine out of ten times, let me rephrase that. Eight out of ten times, I just try to do my best and let it go. And then my wife, now I'm throwing her under the bus. She goes, why aren't you honking? Why aren't you honking? That was dangerous. I said, I don't need a honk. What if that person was, you know, in a rush? But then literally two days later, she's driving. And same thing happened. I said, honey, why, why, why aren't you honking? And she looks at me and she goes, really? And that's when I learned Wow, we need Jesus to be set apart from the world. If not, if we don't have Jesus, we're going to get sucked in and react the same way that the world reacts, whether we like it or not. We need more of Jesus for that hagios to be set apart from the world. So we end here with this, verse 11. Paul prays to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul's prayer for righteousness wasn't just because he wanted people to be morally correct all the time, but he wanted the people to be more like Christ. He wanted people to go grow closer to Christ. He wanted people to have a righteous stand before the Lord being clothed in Christ's righteousness and bearing and producing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit comes from the Lord. Joy comes from the Lord. So a life that exhibits such traits is the glory and praise of God. The fruit of righteousness is not produced on our own. It's not what we do. We don't save ourselves. We can't save this world. The opening of this letter to the church in Philippi, I feel like is, is a letter that the 21st century church needs to read all over again. We become so self-centered and so busy, we don't understand what it means when Christ's love is in overflow. We don't understand what it means when we need to have the knowledge and insight of the Lord. What this first section of gratitude and prayer reminds us is this. We can be thankful for the past. We can be thankful for the present. We can be thankful for the future. Because pure joy, Christ-centered joy, comes from the Lord and not our conditions. And when we pray, we're not called to pray small little prayers. We're called to pray big prayers, big unimaginable prayers prayers because our God is a big God. And that joy that we yearn for, the joy that can fuel us, the joy that can sustain us, starts, continues, and will end with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the day he returns. Let us pray. Jesus, we want to be more like you. We thank you once again through this passage, through the, these words we've learned how important it is to have a joy-filled gratitude, a joy-filled prayer that stems from the mind and heart of our Christ and Savior. May we yearn for that, O oh Lord. May these words be etched into our hearts this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. Invite us to rise in body, air, and spirit as we respond to God's word with the hymn, May the mind of Christ my Savior, and let's make that our prayer this morning.
It's time we've come to a time in our service for our offerings and our tithes. Please join me in prayer as we pray together. Good shepherd, you spread a table before us. We offer you our gifts, signs of your gracious love, your overflowing love, and tokens of our gracious hearts. Nourish us at the feast of the Lamb that we may proclaim to all the world your triumphant love in Jesus Christ. May these offerings and tithes be used mightily for your glorious sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite us to rise in body and word spirit as we worship the Lord with our doxology and end our worship with a benediction. keep me in prayer uh, this afternoon as I uh, represent our classes, our regional district at an installation service in Whitestone, Queens. Uh, I was voted as the chair of our executive committee of classes. Um, so in other words, the other pastors started calling me boss man of classes. Uh, but um, being the classes president or chair, uh, uh, the youngest class this uh, president uh, is not easy, so I need your prayers. Um, but I'll be running over to Whitestone, Queens, immediately after service to, to lead an uh, installation service. So it would be great if you guys can keep me in your prayers. Receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace and peace from who was and who is to come. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the one who loves us overwhelmingly and frees us from all sin, make us into the kingdom and the priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. <laughs>